NTV Television Network presents The Other Day, Current Era, 1976. Translation and voiceover by BMI Russian. Good evening. You're watching episode 16 of our series, The Other Day, 1961 to 1991, Current Era. Events, people and occurrences which defined a lifestyle. Things that we can't imagine ourselves without, let alone comprehend. Another year, another episode. And this time we're covering 1976. Morning Mail, Marshall Brezhnev turns 70, launching the Kamaz plant, wall cabinets, Mao's passing, tinted glasses, fortified wine, Luis Corvalon's release, war in Lebanon, the play Story of the Horse, our MiG-25 flies to Japan. Commenting we have actress Tatiana Trubich, political expert Sergei Karaganov, writer Anatoly Streliany. Back then, Nikita Khrushchev was first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine. On the first day of 1976, Central Television airs a new film by Eldar Ryazanov called The Irony of Fate or Enjoy Your Bath. While giving a speech at the premiere, the director reminds everyone that whatever you wish for on the new year will always come true. The country finds out that Moscow and Leningrad both have third Stroitali streets, buildings 25 and apartments 12. That year the film would make it onto TV two more times. Readers of Soviet screen magazine named Irony of Fate Film of the Year and Andrei Miakov, Actor of the Year. From then on, Irony of Fate would become a permanent New Year's fixture, akin to a fir tree or champagne. Not many people remembered its animated opening sequence, since most folk at that time were still preparing the holiday table. From then you had the doctor from Moscow and teacher from Leningrad, with both capital cities having identical streets, buildings, locks. Barbara Brylska from Poland was redubbed by Valentina Talizina, with Pugachev doing the singing for her. Yuri Yakovlev's respectable character named Ippolit transforms over the course of one night. Can you give me a back rub? Please, I mean, is it really so much trouble? Well, I guess no means no. This fairy tale about life featured 11 songs by Mikhail Tariverdiev and Sergei Nikitin, with lyrics by complicated poets. Singing along to one of those songs immediately made a star of Leah Akhedjakova. There's something I've never heard before. Starting in 1976, the Soviet Union begins to issue new passports. They used to give out green ones with a small black crest and a tiny photo, which were replaced by red ones with a huge crest and enough room for three large photographs. And all because the new passports didn't have an expiration date, with holder inserts instead being glued in at ages 16, 25 and 45. They also no longer contained information on place of work. But everything else stayed the same, though the new passports did look slicker. Komsomol member Boris Serov receives his first ever USSR citizen's passport. At the end of 1975 and the beginning of 1976, two Soviet hockey clubs embark on their first tour around North America. Red Army and Krylia Saverov squared off with the best teams that the NHL had to offer. Subpar performances put on by their pros in previous games were, according to the Americans, a result of those being national team players, who didn't compete too often. Meanwhile, club hockey was where it was at. Regardless, our teams convincingly won the 1976 Super Series. The main event was the game in Montreal. That was when Moscow was getting ready to celebrate the new year, and Red Army was contending with the NHL's most decorated team, 
the 17 times Stanley Cup winning Montreal Canadiens. The game began with a relentless charge on the Soviet goal, with the Canadiens leading 2 to nothing by the 8 minute mark. It was only during the second period when Mikhailov and Varlamov each score one goal. However, thanks to Cournoyer scoring a point, the Canadians were leading during the final period. After the break, Alexandrov evens out the odds, bringing the score to 3-3. Based on the skill set of the teams and how tense the battle turned out to be, this was declared the greatest game in the entire history of hockey. Best player honors went to Vladislav Tretiak, Ivan Cournoyer and Pete Mahovlich. Leonid Brezhnev bestows a gold star medal upon Tatar Zhivkov. In Leningrad's Bolshoi Drama Theater, run by Georgi Tavstanagov, a play called Story of the Horse is presented. One of the most renowned performances in the entire world based on the works of Lev Tolstoy. You're an ugly bugger. Remind me, please, what do you call me? My dear. The human tragedy of a dying gelding named Kulstamir, who used to be a famous piebald stallion, turned out to have the tiniest margin of suspension of disbelief. With people turning into horses, the herd grabbing some hats and umbrellas and yet again becoming a crowd on the run. Yevgeny Lebedev, who played Kulstamir, put on a symphony of plasticity unseen in Soviet theater. During the summer of 1976, Soviet political lingo was enriched with a new term, Soweto, which became the symbol of the black man's struggle against South Africa's apartheid. Soweto is a small town next to Johannesburg, where the working class of South Africa's largest metropolitan area resided. Almost half of Soweto's inhabitants were young people who were either unemployed or had been studying at local schools up until they were 19 to 20 years of age. The uprising sprouted from a student rally. A few people were killed during the scuffle with police, and by the end of day one, 21 administrative buildings in Soweto were on fire. Some of the blacks sided with the police. School kids were attacked by Zulu workers, who were called upon by their tribe chieftain. The riots continued for over six months. 575 people were killed, including five whites. The UN Safety Council condemned South Africa's policy. Meanwhile, in our parts, that consolidated campaign of solidarity with the people of South Africa didn't gain too much momentum. The only thing we picked up was the name Soweto. Four years prior, the anti-alcohol decree ordered to decrease vodka production and ramp up beer and wine output. Given the context, mechanized grape harvesting turned out to be a very useful innovation. By 1976, up to 80% of all the work at vineyards was done by machines. But a large portion of the fruit gets damaged during mechanized harvesting, meaning it has to be processed on the spot, no more than two hours after it was collected. As a result, state farm factories and grape winemaking groups appear. Winemaking begins to boom in Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldavia and the Ukraine. In the Krasnodar region, wine production volume increases 13-fold. In 1976, an industry record is set. Five million tons of grapes. Strings of wine tanks moved out from the warm regions and scattered all around the country, with the wine bottling occurring on location. The cheap gift from the Sun, Anapa, Strong Moldavian and other brands were officially labeled as fortified port wines, cherries and Madeiras, but the people called them Barmatuha. Next to these fortified wines, even vodka appeared to be aristocratic. So in the 70s, the general consensus was that people didn't just drink for the fun of it, but rather out of desperation. Some smartasses with college degrees came to that conclusion, threw it out there to the people, and the people bought into it, while they were drunk naturally. If management was to blame for everything, then why not blame them for widespread alcoholism? People chatting in kitchens would cite a quote that allegedly belonged to some worker type, who said that I get a headache not when drunk, but when I'm sober. 
The implication being that management was doing a bad job. Meanwhile, we're the good guys. Level-headed people associated alcoholism with poverty, which was to say that a large proportion of the population was working hard and filthy jobs. One collective farm director once told me that the 70 ruble earners were the heavy drinkers. For somebody to earn 300 rubles and drink, that was completely unheard of, allegedly. In our parts, any film from India was always a box office hit. And a shining example of such cinema was a melodramatic song and dance piece called Zita Our Gita. India was a world leader when it came to film production. We'd make 150 movies a year, while in India that number was 800 to 900. Bobby and Disco Dancer won over the hearts of those whose parents fell in love with Awara, which was the first film from India that made it to Soviet theaters. Since then, the genre continued living by the same rules. An incredible romance, sweet songs, and moist, wide-open eyes. Half of the time you'd see the familiar last name Kapoor in the credits, whereas you'd have trouble remembering the new stars, like Dharmendra and Chakraborty. With plenty of antimony around the brow and birthmarks signifying belonging to a caste, this film, which left the taste of curry in your mouth and was created in the homeland of Kama Sutra, turned out to be more wholesome than even Soviet movies. Neither Zita nor Gita would so much as even kiss their lovers on screen. Do you feel happy? Right before the start of the 1976 Winter Olympics in Innsbruck, Austria, our national skiing team's leading lady Galina Kulakova became ill. Suddenly, the burden of earning those Olympic medals is placed upon 24-year-old Mokcha Kumi Republic native Raisa Smetanina. In Innsbruck, Raisa Smetanina makes it to second place in the 5km race, while winning the 10km and the relay race together with the national team. For the next few years, she becomes the symbol of Russian skiing. Smetanina went on to win 10 Olympic medals throughout her career, with half of those being gold. On May 8, 1976, with General Secretary Brezhnev having achieved two times hero status, a monument in his name is put up in his hometown of Dnipro Dzerzhinsk, in the Dnipropetrovsk province of Ukraine. The very next day, on May 9, Brezhnev was declared Marshal of the Soviet Union. The man of the hour himself couldn't make it to Dnepradzerzhinsk, and so the monument was unveiled by Ukraine's party leader Sherbitsky. Back in Moscow, Brezhnev receives a marshal's star covered in diamonds, while wearing his celebratory marshal's uniform. It was no mistake that Supreme Soviet Chairman Podgorny, who was presenting the star, said the following. We can confidently say that among our glorious military ranks, this award will be met with much satisfaction indeed. There was good reason to fear silent discontent emerging among professional servicemen. Considering that the rank of marshal was simultaneously assigned to Defense Minister Ustinov, who never served in the army. The Volga automobile plant begins production of a new Lada with the model code 2106. The 4 eyed 6 was the direct descendant of the 2103, basically the trendy daughter to the obsolete mother. It had a new radiator grill design, rubber ridges on the bumpers, modern interior trim, a bit of extra horsepower. This was the first car to feature height-adjustable headrests. Among enthusiasts, only the Volga had more street cred than the Lada 2106. In 1976, for every 1,000 urban residents, there were a mere 15 cars. And that's despite there being a decree in place for developing the co-op garage network. There was still the problem of people having nowhere to store their cars. And finding a spot close to home was an even bigger problem. You couldn't just leave your car parked out on the street. This was the most expensive item you could get. And people expected to keep their cars for at least 10 years. Russian cars, which would break, hesitate to fire up in cold weather and easily begin to rust, had to be kept indoors. A garage co-op would spend 12 to 18 months allocating a spot for building a garage complex, with each shed costing a minimum of 1,500 rubles. Workers and construction material were hard to come by, forcing people to resort to the black market. In 1976, there were about a hundred garage co-ops waiting to begin construction in Moscow. So buying a car was only half the story. Good day, sir. I'm Inspector Danilov. 
You just made a lane change without using your turn signal, and that's illegal. Can I see your license and registration, please? Yes, of course. In 1976, after the International Convention on Road Traffic was ratified, unified driver's licenses were introduced in the USSR. The terms amateur chauffeur, first and second class chauffeur were abolished, and now drivers were assigned qualification categories A motorcycle, B passenger car, C commercial vehicle, D bus, E truck with trailer. For the first time, driver's ed becomes mandatory. On September 6, 1976, an incredible event takes place. Soviet military pilot Belenko, flying his ultra-modern MiG-25 fighter jet, makes his way over to Japan and lands at the Hakodate airport. The Soviet Union's best warbird, fully armed, packing secret codes for distinguishing between friends and enemies, plus an experienced fighter pilot as an instructor, all of this falls into the hands of the potential enemy. In official Soviet statements, the MiG landing in Japan was labeled an emergency. The USSR demanded they return the plane and its pilot. But in the end we received neither. In three weeks a new statement was issued, contradictory in its content and quite harsh in its tone. Soviet representatives were denied access to Bilenko, and when a meeting finally took place, it appeared to those participating as if the pilot was under the influence of some sort of drug. Bilenko's words didn't line up with his desire to seek political refuge in the US though it was immediately declared that he was already on his way there. The Soviet side was especially outraged with the apparent intention to dismantle the plane while involving representatives from third-party countries. Colloquially, this new kind of speedy travel was labeled MIGAM or instantly to Japan. The MiG-25 was one of the best planes ever put out by Soviet industry. Though its story was a tragicomic one to a certain extent, which was pretty typical for Cold War times. So it was built as a response to America's Stratofortress bomber, which in turn was designed to fly at high altitude and at insane speeds. Meanwhile, the MiG-25 was meant to intercept that plane. The United States realized that their Stratofortresses were super expensive and ineffective, and shut down the program. But we had already produced a huge fleet of MiG-25s. Now that runaway plane was carrying a few important secrets with it. First off, in the field of avionics. And second, you had a friend or foe identification system, which was meant to help planes recognize each other during combat. Not to mention a rather effective radar system. All of this had to be redesigned. A tremendous cost. Most relatively well-endowed Soviet citizens wouldn't wear domestic-made clothing, instead preferring imported goods, though very few could get their hands on things from capitalist nations. Truly popular consumer goods came from socialist bloc countries. Socialist integration meant rags in exchange for Soviet crude oil, natural gas and timber. Just about everybody knew which nation specialized in what exactly. Starting in the 1960s, stores selling goods from socialist bloc countries began to pop up in Moscow. The first of those being the Polish Wanda on Gorky Street. During the 70s, every Comic-Con member state was represented by its own store, with each one of those having its own specialty. Buyers from all around the country would make dedicated trips. Vlasta is a Czech name, associated with Jablonek's brand jewelry. They sold stones which were visually similar to pieces of glass and vice versa, as well as the same purses and makeup you'd find anywhere else. The two-story Sofia in Polyanka was for the thrifty buyers, selling plenty of summer clothes made from cotton, sundresses, gowns, blouses, skirts, light knitwear. Situated a bit further was Wanda, which is a Polish name. That's where you'd go to buy some Polina brand makeup, which was some of the best in the socialist bloc, and browse through a large purse, handbag and wallet department. Leipzig, a store which couldn't have been called Berlin due to there being a west side, was primarily the source of women's lingerie from those cleanly Germans. Florena brand makeup was held in high regard. They also sold a specialty item in the form of East German toy railroad sets. Yadran was the most expensive shop, with Yugoslavia being pretty much a capitalist nation. They sold lighting that was supposed to look stylish, and tableware with black-rimmed red mugs being the most valued. A separate entrance leads to the makeup and perfume department. Polish fashion was mostly about trench coats. People would visit these types of stores either to make one big purchase, such as a cloak to wear the next few years, or a couple of relatively modest ones. In the latter case, the goods that they sold were the ideal birthday present. Okay. <laughs>
This was a time of epic TV series. The Eternal Call, Shadows Disappear at Noon, the Strogovs, all of them praise the highest of values, namely a solid family and Soviet government. This TV epic was based on massive novels written by Anatoly Ivanov and Georgi Markov. Parents and children clashing, love stories ending with an appropriate historic decision, with true happiness being common happiness achieved through struggle. Big names, vast scenery and a long story about everyday peasant life. I am a lone monk walking the world with a leaky umbrella. He said that about himself. You keep dreaming about me finally meeting Marx. That was an appeal to his comrades. September 9, 1976 was the day when China's leader finished his journey on this earth. A report from Xinhua News Agency. Chairman of the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee Mao Zedong has passed away in Beijing at age 82. Since 1949, his ranks in the army, the party and the state are all summed up by the title Chairman Mao. The purging, the giant leap and the cultural revolution were all his doings. He acquired an atomic bomb, criticized ancient philosophers, eliminated sparrows and melted steel in household furnaces. He knew what his doings were worth envisioning himself among rulers from the great Chinese dynasties. When he chose to sever relations with the USSR, he held that the East Wind would prevail over the West Wind, while making Nixon and Kissinger a part of his games. The United States played the Chinese card according to us who weren't able to do the same. Three billion books with Mao's quotes were published in various languages of the world. Contemporary art promoted his image of a man wearing a jacket with a mole on his flat face, alongside paintings of Marilyn Monroe. Even before his death, Mao was regarded as a legend of the 20th century. The Soviet people were respectively wary of China with its population of a billion. We'd best pay attention to what's going on in the Far East, or else they might be up to something, was their reasoning back then. Mao was regarded as a cunning and strong leader who kept everyone in check. As for Mao's longevity and high level of energy, him having been married for the fourth time at that age, that was apparently down to the effects of Chinese ginseng and nothing else. Central Committee member Foreign Affairs Minister Raoul Leroy and other officials In May of 1976, the first exhibition of underground Soviet artists was held in a legitimate Moscow exposition hall at Malaya Gruzinska Street. Eighteen months after that notorious bulldozer exhibition, the authorities found a way to communicate with the forbidden art scene. The most courageous left, the weakest folded, and those left who didn't flee were offered a basement at Malaya Gruzinska 28, which was the only opportunity they had to showcase their work, albeit primarily amongst their own. At first they presented the works of seven artists – Vich Tomov, Plavinsky, Krasnopevtsev, Kalinin, Nemukhin, Kandaurov and Haritanov. The International Attraction 76 exhibition held in Gorky Park was attended by 18 different companies from America, Europe and Japan. Since then, Russians developed a taste for American roller coasters. Monster and Enterprise roundabouts, a playground with rocking bridges and 25 play machines didn't leave any room for domestic swing rides and horse carousels. They simply didn't stand a chance. There was also an especially breathtaking ride called Saturn, which rotated in all possible planes at a height of nine stories. Riding hills, which was what they officially called American roller coasters, would take 40 people at once for a ride at very high speed. Soviet moms were divided into those who were and weren't scared to accompany their kids on a roller coaster. And since then, comparable rides from Czech and Polish amusement parks, which would tour the country every summer, received similar names. The civil war in Lebanon, which went on throughout 1976, drove a once peaceful and flourishing nation into chaos. 
Muslim squads were doing battle with Christians, which rapidly polarized Lebanese society. The Muslim units were supported by Palestine, the Christians by Israel. In Beirut, when the largest banks found themselves engulfed in the battle zones, they had millions of dollars stolen from them. Lebanon's capital city was left in ruins, ports were closed, everything was on fire. This was an all-against-all -all war, which raged on until Arab countries brought in a peacekeeping contingent. There was no recognizing the small country of Lebanon. With 40,000 people dead, half a million having lost their homes, and 700,000 refugees. The compact apartments of that era often meant tightly packed furniture, but combined wall cabinets, which people would simply call walls, made this less of an issue and more of a quirk. A dress closet which would seamlessly transition into a drink cabinet, then into a stand for the television, a bookshelf, and a chest with a hinged door. What a stylish and convenient solution! The first walls were imported, with the best ones coming from Yugoslavia, East Germany and Czechoslovakia. Later on, domestic industry would also begin producing these closets, either independently or with help from fraternal countries. A single piece undividable wall closet could only be placed next to the long wall in the biggest room. If the sections were separate, then the only limiting factor was the homeowner's imagination and the apartment layout. Asymmetrical open and closed sections were an especially useful asset, together with varied level shelf placement. This allowed you to inventively alternate between books, souvenirs, vases and radio equipment. Wall closets replaced the assorted furniture people had back in the 60s. German cupboards, Romanian cabinets, clamshell chairs, thin-legged coffee tables, and the rugs hanging on walls. These wall closets looked alike, just like Khrushchev-era five-story apartment buildings. They were painfully similar, reminding you of the legendary film Irony of Fate or Enjoy Your Bath. For some reason, they don't have women's names. Karina, Ramona, Maria. Wall closets were laid out in such a way that they'd display all of the family's valuable items. Collected works by classics, crystal glass, souvenirs. Those who were especially fortunate had imported television sets, since Soviet rubines wouldn't fit in such a closet. While amateur individualists were rummaging through trash for antique items or buying them for close to nothing at thrift stores, regular Soviet people were waiting in line for their wall closets. While in line, you'd wait for a few years to receive a certificate, which would arrive bearing the name of a completely different woman. Wall closets were a sort of collective neurosis for all normal Soviet people, associated with the obsessive notion of well-being. Nineteen seventy-six was when the struggle to liberate the Chilean communist leader Luis Corvalan finally came to a conclusion. It was implied that he was freed from the junta's grasp thanks to pressure from the global community. According to a statement issued by TASS, the Soviet Communist Party and government offered Comrade Corvalan the opportunity to visit the USSR, where he would be given a very warm welcome. Almost immediately, word got out that there was actually a trade occurring. In exchange for Korvalan's freedom, the Soviet side had to release dissident Vladimir Bukovsky from prison. The exchange itself was mediated by East German special services. Soviet human rights advocates had been fighting to free Bukovsky for quite a while at that point, together with international agencies and the US State Department. But such an extravagant move was something nobody expected. By 1976, Korvalan had become a hero of national folklore. This was an honor that even many higher-profile modern historical figures couldn't attain. As for the prisoner from the desolate Chilean Dawson Island, well, he was someone everybody had heard about. With phrases being attached to him such as, I woke up early in the morning to learn that Louis Korvalan was gone. A photo in Komsomolskaya Pravda where Korvalan was posing next to an ocean in a poncho made ponchos even more of a thing in our parts. In the mid-70s, plenty of ladies would compliment their trousers with that weird item. 
which was basically a tablecloth with a cutout in the middle for your head. The story about Korvalon being freed in exchange for Bukowski was quite a simple and catchy one, which quickly spread all across the nation. There was no more point in hiding the fact, and so the first to spill the news was the literature newspaper. During that time a masterpiece Soviet political rhyme was born. They released a hooligan and freed Louis Korvalon. Where can we find such a poor to show Brezhnev out the door? Foreign Detective Stories was one of the most popular book series in the world's most reading country. In 1976, Molodaya Gvardia publishing house doubles the amount of copies printed. Soyuz Kniga evaluated demand, which amounted to no less than a million books, but only a mere 200,000 were printed. At first, the series was published every two years, but then they'd begin to release it annually. They printed the best works of Western masters of the detective genre. Christy Gartner Japrizo. In each book, they'd be offset by a writer from a socialist country. There was a shortage of bread in 1976, with the papers constantly reporting on a poor harvest due to bad weather. At the October plenary meeting, Brezhnev speaks of an extended winter season, cold spring and torrential downpours during the harvest. The harvest itself was a miserable failure, and so bread conservation became a thing. According to calculations, each household was throwing away up to 20 kilos of bread every year. The public would be outraged upon seeing people feeding crumbs to pigeons during a time when bread was a moral category. The main staple of any diet, according to Yuri Rost of Komsomolska Pravda, was a necessity for bringing people together, preserving them, plus it was food. School kids wrote essays titled What Do I Know About Bread, while inevitably citing the daily norm for Leningrad residents during the blockade, which was 125 grams. Containers for food scraps were placed in apartment building hallways. Bakeries would put up stands with household recipes for making kvass, tasty dishes and even sweets out of stale bread crusts. Every cafeteria would have a banner saying, take only as much bread as you need. Bread is precious, so do your best to preserve it. Economic measures, such as ramping up prices, were out of the question, since bread prices were more a political than they were an economic matter. Today, the last of the fruit flies perished. In 1976, the USSR loses its main ally in the Middle East. Egypt's president, Anwar Sadat, announces the cancellation of the Soviet-Egyptian agreement on friendship and cooperation. Military cooperation was to be ceased immediately, with Soviet advisors needing to leave Egypt as soon as possible. The statement issued by the Soviet government read that Sadat's policy was of benefit only to enemies of Egypt and other Arab countries. In other words, to imperialist, Zionist and reactionary forces. Once again, the Soviet people felt betrayed, as in these allies we keep choosing. We supplied the Egyptians with plenty of weapons, we built the Aswan Dam for them, bestowed a hero star upon Sadat's predecessor Nasser, we intervened when they were getting stumped by Israel. But now Egypt and Israel have a common patron. The US withdrew their embargo and began selling military transport planes to Egypt. We just believe everybody despite them fooling us time and again. Enough feeding those brown people when we ourselves have nothing to eat. Given the ever more apparent issues back home, Soviet aid to third world countries was quite an irritating thing. In Nabiryzhnyi Chelny, the first assembly line of the Kama automobile plant is launched. The world's largest factory producing commercial transport was apparently the last shock construction project carried out under socialism that turned out to be absolutely successful. In six years, six factories were built from scratch, with 200 miles worth of assembly lines, and that's how the first series production Kamaz truck came to be. 5,000 vehicles were produced by the end of the year. At first, they only built haulers and trucks, with dump trucks added to the mix a bit later. They could carry a payload of 8 tons, or 16 with a trailer. They featured the first ever 5-speed gearbox and an all-new brake design. And this was the first cabin you could sleep in, with one sleeper located right above the three seats. The Kamaz was the first domestic long-distance truck. The 1976 Summer Olympics took place in Montreal, Canada. In terms of medals earned, the Soviet Olympic team was ahead of the pack yet again. 
But those games would be remembered for events that had nothing to do with sporting competition. An unidentified terrorist threatened Valery Borisov over the phone, claiming that he'd take a sniper shot from the grandstands if he were to walk out onto the starting line for the 100-meter sprint. Our athlete disregards the threat and wins a bronze medal despite having suffered an injury. Meanwhile, pentathlete Boris Onishenko resorts to cheating. He fitted his rapier with a simple mechanical device, which when needed closed the circuit on its own and registered a touch. But during competition, Onishenko was exposed and disqualified. The Soviet Pentathlon Federation expelled him from the national team. In 1976, the all-union recording label Melodia releases its first album. Not just a record containing a random assortment of songs, but a well-thought-out album with inherent structure to it. Composer David Tukmanov's On a Wave of My Memory was a suite consisting of ten musical stories, with poetry by Akhmatova, Voloshin, Butler and Sherry. Tukmanov invited singers and musicians from popular ensembles to record each specific piece, gathering together a unique cast for his record. The album was a historical event for Soviet pop music. Verses from Goliards were played at evening gatherings by several generations of high school kids. However, the leaders of two superpowers agreed on the need for initiating a dialogue. In 1976, General Secretary of the Soviet Communist Party Leonid Brezhnev turns 70. Satellite states declare Brezhnev a hero, while his homeland bestows upon him a second hero star and grants him a personalized weapon with a golden image of the Soviet Union's insignia. That second gift was such an exotic thing that even the veterans were amazed, who recalled the personalized sabers of Civil War times. A communist? A trusty soldier of the Communist Party, Leonid Brezhnev is always at the forefront, tending to the most difficult of tasks. At any time, in any place, this passionate commissary enjoys the love and respect of all fellow communists among the masses. Chairman of the USSR Defense Council, Marshal of the Soviet Union Leonid Brezhnev was also given an honorary weapon with a golden image of the USSR national insignia. Among the things that Brezhnev said during his anniversary were, I am not one of those people who might get dizzy from being praised. That's not something my life has taught me. I will do everything that is in my power for our beloved country to grow stronger and more prosperous, for bettering the lives of Soviet people, promoting peace on Earth and positive cooperation between nations. Brezhnev was a figure in the time of mass and even universal TV viewership. He himself loved to watch TV. And those ceremonies in the Georgievsky, Ekaterininsky and Vladimirsky halls of the Grand Kremlin Palace and in the Politburo Conference Hall were always shown in their entirety. Brezhnev was all over the place. And this turned out to be a determining factor when it came to building his reputation. The ceremonies were long and extremely boring. And from then on, they'd honor any occasion and not just anniversaries. These frequent and exhausting procedures become an indispensable attribute of the so-called era of stagnation. It was obvious that Brezhnev was growing old. Everybody saw how he was having trouble speaking, how his speech impediments were progressing, face growing heavier, gigantic eyebrows moving around. Brezhnev looked like a brutal caricature version of himself, illustrating the Western term Kremlin gerontocrat. Not a single politician had so many jokes made about him as Brezhnev did. There was one about there being no more room for awards on his uniform, forcing a decision to declare Brezhnev's back as his chest. Another one about Brezhnev mistaking the British ambassador for France's envoy and having a chat with him. People were constantly poking fun at him mispronouncing words. After Brezhnev's 70th birthday, 
The ritualized mention of the Communist Party in the Central Committee was expanded by adding, quote, and Leonid Brezhnev personally, end quote. This was immediately mocked by the people, who invented a chant that went, if your woman is hot and in bed she's a handful, then to Leonid Brezhnev you might as well be thankful. Leonid Brezhnev bestows a gold star medal upon Tatar Zhivkov. One of the trendy accessories of the mid-70s was a pair of tinted glasses. We're talking about a light tint, which wouldn't cause any issues indoors. The unevenly distributed coating would be concentrated closer to the edges. The progressively minded short-sighted and far-sighted folk were all installing tinted lenses into their glasses, and people with uncompromised vision would wear tinted glasses with no prescription. Seeing through tint was a modern outlook with a scattered gaze directed towards the outside world and a deeper view aimed inwards. In 1976, director Ivan Ufimtsev produces a cartoon based on a script by Grigory Oster called 38 Parrots. Thus began the educational series starring parrot, monkey, elephant, calf and python. The most philosophically rich kids animated series from the Soviet Union. The jungle setting didn't distract the main characters and keep them from resolving critical issues, such as how to measure a python's length, how to sum up the law of gravity, and how to figure out when the future is coming. These clumsy dolls argue about sending regards, helping the young audience get used to absurd humor. We're not gonna call anybody out, but it was the elephant calf. Nineteen seventy six was the year of the twenty fifth Congress of the Soviet Union's Communist Party, which consisted of fifteen million seven hundred thousand members. To the delegates present at the Congress and to our esteemed guests. Brezhnev reads from a gigantic report at the morning and evening conferences. The Soviet Union, having risen to become the world's second superpower, took pride in being the world's foremost country in terms of coal, iron ore and crude oil output, as well as steel and mineral fertilizer production. A decision was made to limit admission of new members to the Communist Party, while primarily accepting workers and implementing more stringent demands for intellectuals. For example, from some institutes they'd allow just one person to be admitted annually, who would likely be a young female specialist. Given the occasion, 600,000 letters were sent to the Central Committee. A decree was issued on further refining the processing of mail from workers. All agencies and government officials were given the recommendation to pay more careful attention to suggestions and complaints. Letters had to be processed within one month, after which the author had to be informed on the results. Magazines and newspapers, TV and radio shows were obligated to resort more often to audience mail when doing their work and report on measures taken in response. They were encouraged to have segments such as responding to fan mail, business trip in response to a letter, or hitting the road after receiving a letter. Other things sent by workers would be reviewed by a weekly program called Morning Mail. At 11 o'clock on Sundays, the host would share a bit of delicate commentary while the latest Soviet hits would be playing on the show. The International Review edition, which would typically be released once a month, was labeled Foreign Pop Melodies and Rhythms. Morning Mail would tend to showcase performances, so recordings not from concerts, but rather filmed specifically for the program. Incidentally, this show is where the morning star of Yuri Nikolaev began to ascend. Morning Mail's host was of a higher status than any other Soviet entertainer. During one episode, there was a disclaimer that said, Yuri Nikolaev works without resorting to body doubles. Morning Mail's roster would sometimes include music that wasn't particularly relevant, while foreign pop melodies and rhythms would do that on the regular. The latter would most often include songs by Czechoslovakian Nightingale Carol Gott and some East German TV ballet, though you'd sometimes get a brief glimpse at something a bit more lively, which would leave viewers waiting and hope that liberalism would again get at least a bit of airtime.
And so we're done with the 1976 episode of our show The Other Day, 1961 to 1991, Current Era. Next time we'll discuss 1977, the Neva SUV, Brezhnev for President, rising carpet and crystal glass prices, a fire in the Russia Hotel, Adam Mush, the Tigris, a bum, Baltic vacations. See you for another episode and another year. Farewell.